Well, it's, it's just such a great pleasure to be here with my dear friend Andrew. This is something we've been talking about doing for a long time. So here I am finally. And I just want to, I, I was saying to a number of you that, um, that I have roots in the South. My, gra my grandmother was um, fifth, fourth, fourth generation from New Orleans. And uh, that, uh, that I felt that I was already getting closer to home by being here. But you all have received me with, in, in such a warm sort of way that I already feel that I'm at home. So just delighted to, to be receiving this, this uh, I think you all are calling it a Memphis welcome. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. So back in June, I think um, many of you will remember the world lost a man by the name of Helmut Kohl, who was the chancellor of Germany. And he was the chancellor who helped to reunite East and West Germany um, after the leading up to the fall of the wall. Now, Helmut Kohl was a great admirer of the subject of tonight's lecture, Dietrich von Hildebrand. And he once said something that I'd like to read to you as a kind of uh, opening characterization of Dietrich von Hildebrand. He said of von Hildebrand that he was a witness from a dark era in German history. I think Kohl captures something very profound and essential. And Hildebrand grasped the essence of German National Socialism, of Nazism, at a moment when few others did. And he gave testimony to the evil of Nazism, yes, but above all, to the central truths about the human person that were being obscured by the Nazi ideology. So that's what I think Kohl had in mind when he spoke of von Hildebrand as a witness from a dark era in German history. Now let me tell you a little bit about the life of von Hildebrand. And what I'd like to do tonight is weave together the story of his life, a very remarkable life, with his, with his struggle against National Socialism, uh, a heroic struggle, uh, an unforgettable testimony that he's left behind. And then I'd like to talk to you about some of the, the, the substance of his resistance so you can understand him not just as a courageous, outspoken voice, but you can understand what he had to say and then we can think about what it might mean for us today as we go forward as, as Christians in the world that we live in. So Dietrich von Hildebrand was born in 1889 in Florence into a German family. He was the last child, uh, he had five older sisters and he was the one son, greatly welcomed in the family. His father was a renowned sculptor by the name of Adolf von Hildebrand. This was one of, great, of, of Munich's uh, great artistic families, and as a, I, I think one can say that most artists of the time felt the need to go to Italy. My friend Andrew apparently has felt the need to go to Italy. And so von Hildebrand grew up in the family villa in Italy, and then they would cycle between Italy and, and Germany. And to give a sense of the, of the stature of the family, you might say that the, the Hildebrands were a kind of Kennedy family in the local society, not, as, not in a political sense, but in, a, in an artistic sense. The family was nominally Protestant, and their only religion, their true religion, was beauty in art and nature. And Christianity was seen primarily as an expression of, of culture. So they would go to a church not to worship, they would go to a church in order to admire the works of art. Now, von Hildebrand, as a young boy, fell in love with philosophy as a young teenager, reading the dialogues of Plato. And I know that to most of us that seems pretty precocious, and he certainly was, but it was an extraordinary family. Now what captivated him about, about Plato was not just the, the joy of, of, I'm sorry, I'm probably causing this, the joy of logical argumentation. He was a, a brilliant young man. But it was above all the absolute priority that he saw Plato giving to the question of truth. And not truth in an academic sense, truth in, the sense, uh, in a sense of truth that could be lived. In other words, what is the question of truth for my life? What, how do I need to live? And for him, Plato, and in the character of Socrates, who is the great figure in the Platonic Dialogues, uh, von Hildebrand discovered a figure who placed, made that question the all-important question of his life. So as a young boy, he, uh, as a young teenager, von Hildebrand decided he wanted to study philosophy. And so in 1906, he went to study uh, at the University of Munich. And he would study with some of Germany's leading lights uh, at the time. He studied with a man named Edmund Husserl, um, who is perhaps, perhaps the most important student of interest to all of you here, besides Dietrich von Hildebrand, was a certain St. Edith Stein, who was Husserl's student. And St. Edith Stein was, in fact, a younger classmate of Dietrich von Hildebrand's. And then von Hildebrand also studied under a man by the name of Max Scheler. And we can talk about Scheler a little bit later. But the great interest, perhaps, for you is that Scheler was also a tremendous influence on John Paul II, who wrote his dissertation in philosophy 
on Max Scheler. So von Hildebrand was, you might say, um, uh, in the company of these, of these very significant figures who would have such an influence on both the larger culture and also on the life of the church. Now remember, von Hildebrand is not a Catholic. He's not even really a Christian. And yet, thanks to the influence of Scheler, he would convert to the church. And Scheler uh, did it in a very remarkable way, I think a significant way for, those, for, for us today. He did not argue primarily from the truth of the gospel. He didn't argue from the historical reality of the church. He said this to von Hildebrand. He said, the Catholic church is the true church because she produces saints. So it was the unearthly beauty of the saints and of Christ above all that more than anything else drew von Hildebrand to Christianity and to Catholicism. And so he and his first wife converted to Christianity on Easter, Holy Saturday of 1914. The conversion of, of Dietrich von Hildebrand was the central reality of his life. Of all the other uh, events of his, of his dramatic life, nothing was, there was no uh, before and after quite like that of his conversion. But something important as we explore the life of von Hildebrand, if the beauty of Christ and the saints drew him to Christianity, it was his philosophical commitment, it was the commitment to truth that above all allowed his faith to mature. And he says this very remarkable thing in one place, he says, quote, it was not the faith that determined my, my fundamental philosophical orientation, rather it was my philosophical views that leveled my path for the reception, it leveled the path for my reception into the Catholic Church. Now I'm gonna sort of pass over World War I and his his experiences there, which are very interesting to, in the interest of moving on, but that's something we could also talk about because it's important. So in 1919, von Hildebrand is 29 years old. He's appointed at the University of Munich now as a member of the philosophy faculty. And he would teach there until 1933 when Hitler came to power. Now, I think one can say that Dietrich von Hildebrand was the first major Catholic of stature to raise his voice against National Socialism. When we think about the Nazis, we think about the late 30s, we think about World War II. In 1923, Dietrich von Hildebrand already had to flee for his life the first time the Nazis sought to seize power in Germany. And the reason for that was that he had been an outspoken opponent, not of the Nazis, he hadn't named them in a public way, but he spoke against German nationalism. Uh, this was the, in many ways, what he saw as being the root of World War I. And for his attack on nationalism, which led them to dub him as a traitor, he was a German traitor in the eyes of the Nazis because of his critique of German aggression during the war. So that's what put von Hildebrand on their radar. It wasn't that he was a, a running in a different political party and speaking against the Nazis. He spoke against one of their core pillars. It's very interesting to hear what von Hildebrand's students have to say from the years in which he's teaching at the University of Munich and Hitler and the Nazi party are gaining momentum in German public life. I want to read you a few quotes. One of them later wrote the following. He said, von Hildebrand had a great talent for detecting what was in the air, almost as if he had a kind of barometer for what was ominously brewing in the atmosphere. And while, this is now my own words again, while Hildebrand's comments could be blunt, I tell you the Nazis are the most vicious animals, he said in 1924. He was also enormously persuasive. And another student later said, and this is very telling, he said, quote, von Hildebrand immunized and protected us from the philosophical waves that swept across Germany in those days. Heidegger, uh, Heidegger's melodies, Heidegger was the great pro-Nazi academic of the day. Heidegger's melodies no longer had the power to seduce us, for our ears had become more discerning. Whoever understood von Hildebrand was saved. Despite the many factors at work, I think that history might have been quite different had there been more professors like him. Sort of the ultimate testimony to the impact of a teacher. Now, much as von Hildebrand hated German nationalism, German militarism, the fight against anti-Semitism lay at the heart of the young professor's critique of Nazism. He recognized that anti-Semitism, which thrived on deep-seated stereotypes and antipathies prevented many Germans and Austrians from recognizing the horror of Nazism. He says this very, pro he has this very probing assessment here in an essay he wrote after the war. He says the following, quote, anti-Semitism was the forerunner of national socialism. Anti-Semitic propaganda, conscious or unconscious, means helping Hitler and breaking the moral defense line against Nazism. 
Anti-Semitism was not just incompatible with everything he believed about human dignity and about human rights. It was also deeply at odds with his convictions as an ardent Catholic. And this is one of his great and lasting contributions in the church, something that we're all beneficiaries of. For he showed with almost prophetic clarity the essential incompatibility between Christianity and racism. To fellow Christians who became infected by anti-Semitism, he said, a wonderful quotation, God is equally offended by the murder of a Jew, a socialist, or a bishop. Catholic-Jewish relations were transformed after Vatican II due in no small measure to the influence of people like Dietrich von Hildebrand who purged anti-Semitism where it had taken root within Christian thought and practice. There's so much more we could say about anti-Semitism, but I'll move on here. Now, I think we would move a central achievement of von Hildebrand's battle against racism and nationalism if we saw them just as acts of courage in the face of manifest evil. What sets him apart from so many of his contemporaries was a rare immunity from the, from the, from the influence of prevailing ideas. We cannot read his memoirs without opening ourselves to the possibility that many of us, had we lived in that time, would have been seduced by the siren song of National Socialism, falling into some compromise or other without, and without marveling at von Hildebrand's exceptional independence of spirit in unmasking Hitler. Now, when Hitler became chancellor January 30th of 1933, von Hildebrand was confronted with a choice. Would he remain in Nazi Germany? And the choice was even more radical than that. Could he remain in Nazi Germany? And the reason it was framed that way was because he said to himself, I'm a Catholic and I'm a philosopher. As a Catholic, I can't speak untruth. As a philosopher, I have an obligation to speak truth in public. If I silence myself, I fail in my vocation as a Catholic philosopher. So by the end of February, Hitler is consolidating power between his appointment as chancellor and in these early months of 1933, when Hildebrand's decision was made, he could not stay in Germany. It's true that he had to consider his safety, and I only say that because sometimes in the Hildebrand bios, you'll read that he fled. It's not quite true. Uh, he was certainly a well-known enemy of the Nazis, but I think had he silenced himself, had he uh, remained more of, uh, of an internal critic of National Socialism, he could have remained in Germany, as many people did. But he knew that he had a, he had a conviction that he was obliged or being called by God to speak openly against Nazism, and he knew he could only do that from outside Germany. When Hildebrand left Germany, he left on March 12th of 1933. He abandoned everything that was dear to him, his friends and his family member. His, some of, several of his five sisters lived in Munich. A huge network of friends and associates, students, his rising career and a beautiful home that he had inherited from his father, the sculptor father. His home, by the way, now belongs to the state of Bavaria, and maybe fittingly, it's a library. It's a beautiful, beautiful place that can be visited. And he writes in his memoirs, I expressly made a conscious farewell to the beloved house, indeed, to every single room. It was clear to me that I was unlikely ever to see it again. But while his departure was, as he says, inexpressibly painful, he never succumbed to bitterness. Better to be a beggar in freedom, he writes in one place in his memoirs, than to be forced into compromises against my conscience. So this departure of von Hildebrand is remarkable because we know, based on the story of his life where he went, but he didn't know where he was going. He was plunging himself into the unknown. And one has to describe it as a kind of radical act of thrusting himself into the arms of God and believing that God would honor his decision to follow his conscience. And so he goes to the place of his birth, to Florence in 1933, where it, which now belongs to a sister. And there's a time of discernment, what to do, what to do next. And during this time, he received a questionnaire from the University of Munich. Hard to believe this could have happened. And the questionnaire was a racial questionnaire. The question was, are you of Aryan descent? And he could have said yes. He had a Jewish grandmother, which made him a quarter Jew, but under the Nazi race laws, that was not sufficient enough uh, to make him Jewish. Nevertheless, he wrote a defiant no. He writes, I was loath even to recognize the decision and to join the ranks of the non-persecuted Aryans. And a few months later, the Nazis fired him from the university in response to the decision. And then later on, they, uh, they stripped him of his German citizenship and he had set the ball in motion. It was a radical act. 
But this caused him no regrets, this firing from the university. He wrote, I was proud at this moment to belong to the persecuted non-Aryans. Now we come to this time of discernment, these very difficult six months approximately. So he's there in Florence. He's surrounded by people who don't understand why he's taking this whole Hitler phenomenon so seriously. They're preoccupied with other things. He describes in his memoirs a spring music festival, which exists to this day in Florence. And that was everyone's interest at the time. And so he lived in a kind of inner exile uh, without any real sympathy. So he turns to philosophy, and he begins to write an, an important book on philosophy. He's also visited by a young relative of his who had a great political sense, and they began to talk about politics and what they might be able to do in the battle against Nazism. And so they take note of the Chancellor of Austria. He was a young, relatively young man at the time, I think not even in his 40s yet, a man by the name of Dolfus, Engelbert Dolfus. And von Hildebrand perceived him as the only European head of state who had a fundamentally anti-Nazi political platform, unlike all of the great powers that were engaged in looking the other way or trying to find uh, ways of dealing with Hitler. Uh, Austria, little Austria, uh, already took a posture of resistance. And this was something that Dietrich von Hildebrand admired greatly. So he attempted several times to meet Dolfos to no effect. It was very humbling for him because, you know, Hildebrand is a man from a great family, and here he is not being able to get an appointment even with someone he wants to serve. Finally, he gets through to Dolfos and he says, I want to be an intellectual officer in the battle against Nazism. And Dolfos was impressed, and he agreed to finance a new anti-Nazi, anti-communist newspaper, a weekly, that von Hildebrand would edit. And this, this newspaper was then published from late 1934 into 1938. I forget the exact number of issues. Maybe there were not quite 100, maybe 85 issues or so that were published. And it became the premier journal for the intellectual and cultural battle against Nazism and communism. It was a journal that featured a whole variety of voices. Von Hildebrand would write an article in each piece, but also other voices in the resistance. And so it became a kind of centerpiece of uh, particularly Germans who had left Germany and gone to Austria to try to resist Hitler from abroad. Now you might think that von Hildebrand would have been welcomed in Austria with this chancellor who had an anti-Nazi position. That's not at all true. Uh, from his arrival in the fall of 1933, I meant to say the journal was already published in the fall of 19, December 1933, so almost five years. From the time of his arrival, Hildebrand was a controversial figure attracting both supporters and detractors. He was accused of being extreme. Think of if any of this is familiar to us today. He was ex accused of being extreme, of failing to accept the inevitable, of refusing to cooperate with those who thought they could influence the Nazi regime by collaborating with it. But none of this deterred him. Hildebrand's newspaper had a circulation in the thousands, including many hundred subscriptions back in his home country of Germany. Yet his voice echoed far beyond Austria, Hitler wanted him silenced. The Nazi government repeatedly demanded the suppression of the newspaper. And Hildebrand on several occasions was warned that assassination plots were being mounted against him, all of which he took with a great deal of serenity. His voice was even heard here in the United States, as we've discovered in a, in a, in a, in a memo that we found, uh, did a freedom of information search through the FBI to find a very different set of documents. Well, we find this memo apparently signed by J. Edgar Hoover himself in which he describes von Hildebrandt as a famous foe of Nazism and as the editor of the most violently anti-Nazi newspaper in Germany. Surely a tremendous compliment from the, from the fierce director of the FBI. So what was the substance of von Hildebrandt's nearly 70 essays? They covered a broad range of topics and addressed themselves to multiple audiences. As a philosopher, Van Hildebrand saw clearly that Nazism was not just another political movement. He saw it as an entire vision of reality that was fundamentally at odds with Christian thought and culture. It was in competition with Christianity. So he wrote in the mission statement of his journal, and I love the way it's entitled. Uh, on the very first page of the journal, it says, what we want. It doesn't say our mission is, it says what we want. And he wrote, at a time of great ferment and confusion, we have to present clearly the eternal universally valid ideas of the state, of the nation, of the human person, of right and wrong, authority, freedom, and personality. He felt it was necessary to do so to move people from a partial rejection 
of Nazism. For example, Austrians who were opposed to Hitler's annexation of Austria, they wanted to remain independent, but who had bits of anti-Semitism. He wanted to move these people from this partial rejection to a principled rejection of Nazism as such, meaning that there was no dealing with Hitler possible at all. So that's a very important part of the essays that he wrote. And there was another batch of essays, and sometimes this is interwoven with the, the ones I've just mentioned. And these were not so directly focused on a critique of Nazism, but they were focused on trying to strengthen the clarity and resolve of people, often those who rejected or regretted Nazism, but sought to avoid any open confrontation with it. In these essays, Van Hildebrand writes not so much as a thinker, but as a kind of moral and spiritual master, calling on his fellow Catholics and Christians. And so they have a special resonance for us today as we look for guidance. I, I like to describe them as a field manual for moral living, for Christian living in circumstances in which our faith is challenged from all sorts of different sides. Let me walk you through a few of the themes that are at the heart of these articles. So one of them is the danger of compromise in the face of evil. So he writes in one place, people generally remain indignant only for a short while. After a certain time, a person becomes tired of disapprobation, even if the deed that led to his revulsion goes unpunished and if the sin continues to cry out to heaven. If we cannot find relief for our indignation by doing something ourselves, and if we're powerless in the face of the continued existence of evil, we soon resort, excuse me, we soon revert to everyday living. So then Hildebrand wants to strongly encourage people not to fall into this kind of posture where we're ground down by the constant exposure to moral evil in our society. But he wants something more than that. He says, uh, the following, he says, a person's ability to make ethical distinctions would not be weakened in any way if he were to arrive at an inner peace by enduring as something permitted by God an evil that he cannot effectively combat, not in any way resigning himself to it, nor wavering in his inner rejection of it, but enduring it with the, rejection, with the awareness that he does not have the power to remove every evil from the world. For that can only be done by the Lord who says, vengeance is mine. I'm reminded of a, I wonder if this is the slide. Yeah, this is a, a letter that von Hildebrand wrote in 1933 already. So this is actually written at the time that he's trying to figure out his future and various friends and members of his family are showing some worrying signs of enthusiasm for Hitler. They're, they're enthusiastic for the, the sense of historical momentum of the new, of the breakthrough of, of something new in the presence of the old. Um, and then Hildebrand wrote a letter which he sent back to friends in Germany. Unfortunately, all the copies of this letter are destroyed because anyone who would have had this letter would have destroyed it immediately for fear of having been caught with it. But in this letter, he, does, he, he, he offers this, this wonderful idea of a kind of inner resistance. And I guess I'll just read it since it's so powerful. He says that in Nazism, I explained that they were being confronted by the Antichrist and that if they were forced to live with him, indeed, even to be exposed to his force, it was absolutely necessary to bear the concealed dagger, as it were, of absolute and irreconcilable, irreconcilable enmity ready to make first, of it, first use of it, excuse me, ready to make use of it at the first opportunity. So the idea was that, that even if we were powerless in an external sort of way, that we always had the ability, we always have the ability to take inner stances to things. And so the idea was that if you were confronted with something, rather than just looking the other way, say you saw uh, maybe a colleague made a disparaging remark about the Jews. Maybe you didn't have the ability to correct them. Maybe they were your, your, um, your supervisor at work. In the Hildebrandian, idea of things, in a moment like that, you wouldn't just you know, shake your head regrettably, but you would take an inner stance in which you would remind yourself of the evil of what was happening around you, and in a sense, recommit yourself to the truth. It was a kind of sharpening of the conscience that he wanted to ensure, and he thought that if we didn't continuously do this, that eventually we would become so used to these types of things that we would not even notice the, the moral evil that they contained. Another theme that Hildebrand frequently returned to in his essays is that of quietism in the face of evil. So this in a way goes in a, in a somewhat different direction uh, from the previous point. 
Here he was addressing, in particular, his fellow Christians who were advocating a withdrawal from public life in pursuit of a kind of religious purity mm -hmm. in their own homes and communities. The idea was that the culture is so far gone that all we can really do is to try to create uh, communities that are deeply Christian, and in these communities we will protect our children, we'll raise our, our, our children, and we'll essentially sort of allow the culture to sort of go into its inexorable decline. And Van Hildebrand had very critical words about this uh, this posture of many of his fellow Catholics. He wrote, in, in a time when the state expressly advances totalitarian claims and incessantly seeks to overstep its sphere of competence, indifference to the political sphere on the, pa on the part of Catholics constitutes an outright desertion mm -hmm. of duty. Of course, Van Hildebrand recognized that political activity was not the only way in which a committed Christian lived their life, or as he put it in another place, Quote, the principal contribution of the Christian is his own personal transformation in Christ. But this must not be his only contribution. The apolitical disposition cultivated by certain Catholics, says Hildebrand, which induces others to refrain from exposing and relentlessly fighting against Nazism is an evil sophism. Now, Van Hildebrand wanted to remain a voice in the battle against Nazism as long as possible. And as a reminder, He's in, in Austria, which is remaining independent from the time of his arrival in 1933. But there's a great tension, a great battle within Austrian public life between those who want to unite Austria to Germany, the so-called Anschluss, and then others like von Hildebrand who wanted to resist that at all costs. Uh, von Hildebrand believed that it was the mission of Austria at this moment to, uh, in some sense, protect true German values uh, at a moment when Germany was in denial of its own great heritage. And it was, he would sometimes speak of, of uh, Austria's great German hour, meaning Austria to the rescue of Germany. So he totally opposed the idea of a union with Hitler. But eventually, the, uh, the pressure became enormous on Austria to accept an inevitable annexation. And it's remarkable that there were, there were so many signs that it was coming, and many, many people could have quite legitimately decided to flee. You know, von Hildebrand had done his part. But he wanted to stay, and in fact, there was even an occasion where, um, where word came that the Anschluss is happening, and von Hildebrand flees desperately, only to discover it was a false, it was a false alarm. But rather than saying, I've, I've left, I might as well keep going, he comes back to Vienna, because he wants to continue in this battle until the very, very last moment. He had hoped that perhaps his newspaper could create enough pressure on the Austrian regime that they would resist up until the last moment. So time does not permit me to tell you the story, the rather thrilling story of the escape of von Hildebrand, and perhaps in the Q&A I can tell you a little bit more about it. But let me just say that, well, it's basically made for Hollywood, right? He gets out on the last train leaving Vienna, and it's a train filled with Austrian Jews fleeing, and they get to the Czech border, and an announcement is, ma is made no Austrian citizens may leave, which basically means all the Austrian Jews have to stay. And von Hildebrand, um, through the good fortune of his family, carried a Swiss passport. His, his, father, his grandfather had been made a Swiss citizenship, and as Alice von Hildebrand likes to say, Swiss citizenship is like baptism. You can't lose it. And so it's, it was passed on to von Hildebrand and to his wife at the time, and so they got through the checkpoint um, where within a few hours there would also have been arrest warrants for him. They got through the checkpoint thanks to these Swiss passports. I still have uh, these passports. It's very moving to look at the, the exit visas, as you can imagine. So what is the essence of von Hildebrand's battle against Hitler? And how might it differ from other figures, figures who are perhaps well known to you when you think of, of the opposition? Some of you may have heard of the great Protestant pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There's a great Jesuit, Father Alfred Delp. And then there was a famous circle called the Kreisau Circle, which included many Jesuits and also lay Catholics. Uh, it, each of these different circles made remarkable contributions. And there were the many people who stayed behind in Germany and in their own way gave witness. I think there's always a natural tendency, maybe it's even a, a tendency we have as Americans, to measure the impact of resistance in terms of external action. Maybe it's a political bias. And so the members of the July 1944 plot that sought to assassinate um, Hitler, there's this great film on it, Valkyrie, the story of um, Klaus von Stauffenberg, 
the members of this plot, they naturally occupy a high place in our respect and admiration. And they should. Klaus von Stauffenberg and his companions, they made the ultimate sacrifice, fueled by burning conscience and a great love of their homeland. Now, it's quite clear to me that von Hildebrand would have willingly given his life in the fight against Nazism. In fact, in the book, My Battle Against Hitler, we see that he was repeatedly blacklisted, and for most of his time in Vienna, he lived in constant danger of assassination. And I might just, as, a, as an aside, tell the, the, the lovely story of the time he was once warned by the chief of the secret police in Austria, and this is sort of, I don't know why I'm saying this other than that it's true, uh, that the, is sort of typically Austrian, but this chief of the police said, you know, it would be very embarrassing for me to have a political assassination in my precinct. Um, and von Hildebrand said, it would be very embarrassing for me too. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the chief of the police gave him all sorts of warnings. You can't, you know, never, let a, never get into a taxi with a stranger, never let a taxi in, don't open the door to strangers, take your name off your door, et cetera, et cetera. All of which von Hildebrand wasn't doing because he was actively helping refugees and he was eagerly meeting people who were united in this cause. And then he says, uh, in, in one of the most moving places in the memoirs, he says, certainly the, the chief of the police words made an impression on me. He says, but I can honestly say that it in no way changed my resolve to end my political resistance. He said that I had the conviction that I was doing what God was asking of me, and so I was not afraid. And this sense of, of complete serenity and resting in the providence of God under these extraordinary circumstances. I think it's just one of the most beautiful and moving things about the witness. And it sort of, it, it rounds out the heroism. I mean, you could, I mean there, are, there is such a thing as a cranky hero, I suppose, right? Someone who makes a sacrifice but, and, and it's, a, it's really an extraordinary thing, but they, they suffer loudly and they let you know. But von Hildebrand uh, lost everything and lived in tremendous and constant uh, difficulty and need and discomfort. And this is the way in which he speaks about his experiences. But moving along, so to look for active plotting in the Hildebrand dossier, if I can put it that way, would be to miss his essential contribution and the lasting example for us today, most of us who are not actively involved in uh, great feats of espionage and re political resistance. His greatest concern was for the moral and spiritual integrity of his fellow German especially German Catholics, but all Germans, in the face of Nazism. Even in the case of a person who had little political power or public influence, Van Hildebrand thought that it was vital that they remain morally alert through an active inner life of acceptance and disavowal, accepting the truth and, whenever possible, in the presence of evil, internally disavowing the untruth. This is, by the way, why he so regretted this famous concordat that was signed by the Vatican in Germany in 1933. And he didn't criticize it for its substance. The, the purpose of this concordat was to protect the church's right, the, the religious, excuse me, religious freedom for German Catholics, the right to continue to operate schools. He didn't criticize the substance of it, but he thought that it would confuse and undermine ordinary Catholics and undermine their spirit of resistance because it would give a kind of legitimacy to the Nazi party. So what of us today? What essential components of witness can we learn from Hildebrand for ourselves? So I'm gonna highlight just three, knowing that there are uh, innumerable uh, takeaways for us today, and we can perhaps talk more about them in the Q&A. So first, Hildebrand displayed an extraordinary independence from the influence of ideas that were somehow in the air. We certainly can't expect to exhibit Christian courage in a secular age if we're uncritically receptive to the influences of our age. This doesn't mean that we have to outright reject everything that is typical of our time, but it does mean that there has to be a constant conscious purification of the ideas that we take in uh, to ourselves. It can't be a pure passive receiving. Second, Van Hildebrand shows us that vital ideas must be championed and that their embodiment in law and public policy is not, a make, not enough to make them operative in culture. Already in 1933, he realized that the call of the hour was not just a circling of the wagons to protect an intact Christian culture, but that this culture was in crisis. This is why he said in the mission statement, as I read earlier, we have to present clearly the eternal, universally valid ideas of the state, of the nation, of the person. He reminds us that reproposing basic truths is a basic mode of cultural engagement. It's not just enough 
to know that our church teaches it. They have to constantly be reproposed and made persuasive again. Third, Van Hildebrand shows us that there are both universal uh, moral requirements and individual moral vocations. This is to say that while everyone is morally obliged to reject an evil ideology, different persons may be called to different modes of witness. Van Hildebrand realized that many, if not most, of his countrymen would remain in Germany and that this was even necessary for the ultimate defeat of Nazism. But as in his own case, he did not hesitate to live that universal call with particular intensity and a readiness to make exceptional sacrifices. What would Van Hildebrand say to us today? He would no doubt especially welcome those of us who feel called to public moral witness, but he would be no less happy to learn that someone had discovered a calling to bear witness even in a humble, obscure, and personal way. And he would extend to each of us the solace that he found so richly expressed in the words of Abraham from the Old Testament, words that he quotes throughout his memoirs, Deus Provi David, God will provide. Thank you. John, I'd like to commend your presentation. It was outstanding. My question is this. Um, my brother and I used to be in the wine and liquor import business, and we dealt extensively with Germans. And some of our German friends said that after Hitler, that when he uh, seized power, actually elected in 19, January 1933, many Germans said, yes, the Nazis are repressive, but Stalin and the Bolsheviks are much worse, and let's just go ahead and tolerate Hitler. Um, how did Mr. How did Mr. Uh, von Hildebrand feel about, I know he opposed Stalin and the Bolsheviks, but did he regard them as co-equal in, in malevolence? Yes, yeah, he, he more or less saw them as sort of evil twins. Um, they, and he thought that in their roots, despite the fact that, so you have to remember that in that time, you know, the, the, the mortal enemy of a communist was a national socialist, right? It was not, the Nazis and the communists would have hated each other. They're, they're, they were the, uh, the arch enemies in politics at the time. So it gave the impression that these were the alternatives, not to be a national socialist was to be a communist and so on. And von Hildebrand spent a lot of his energies trying to show people that the real alternative uh, was not between Nazism and communism, but between ultimately uh, a totalitarian ideology and Christianity. He says that was, the, that was the real antithesis. He says one can't oppose one untruth with another untruth, right? So the untruth of Nazism and the untruth of communism don't really oppose each other. They may be in tension with each other, but they're not the opposite. It's, Christi it's Christianity. And in fact, he writes an interesting article, one of the only articles that's written in a way for a secular audience. You have to remember there wouldn't really have been a secular audience in the same way as we have today. In, in the, 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 under, the, the assumption was still uh, a dominant Catholic culture in Austria. But there's one essay that he writes in which he speaks about um, this very issue. And he wants to say that, uh, he, says very, he, he, he has this idea that the, um, that the, the battle is between uh, these ideologies and Christianity, but that Christ, even Christian culture has to be understood in a wider sense. And he, and he wanted to, under, to say it in such a way that even someone who didn't see themselves as a Christian could say, but in this battle against uh, totalitarianism, I, am, I stand with Christian culture. And what did he mean? He said, for example, Christian culture is defined by the fact that truth is foundational for the order of society. It doesn't mean everyone agrees, but it means we all, or it doesn't agree on what is true, but we agree that truth is essential. So we, we quarrel over what's true, but we don't argue whether truth exists. He says that in Christian Western culture, the dignity of the person is fundamentally understood. In, the other, in, in other words, the, the state can never undermine and deprive the person of that. And then he says also that the rights of conscience have always been honored, if not perfectly, they're at least in, a, in seed form, they're essential to Christian Western culture. And he wanted to say by, by, by making these points that, that, um, that in defending the West, we were ultimately defending the true alternative to National Socialism, and in such a way that anyone, believer or non-believer, in this battle could be uh, united. It's interesting, when he went to Vienna, he was appointed at the University of Vienna, all Catholic colleagues, there was one atheist on the faculty, a certain Moritz Schlick, who's a rather famous, um, to this day, philosopher. 
And um, all of the Catholics rejected von Hildebrand as an excessive, um, sort of just extreme critic of the Nazis. His one ally was the atheist on the faculty. They saw it eye to eye, and he thought that in this moment, all these other issues that fundamentally divide myself and this atheistic philosopher are put aside because we are united in the stance against National Socialism. Well, it, it, the answer is yes and no. A good, good philosophical answer, right? Uh, both and. So the, uh, the the answer is that he he wrote a book that was the basis of a book la later published under the title "What Is Philosophy," and in many ways it's a it's a book that is very far from politics. It's on questions of how we know the truth and how do we know it all and so on. But in as much as it was a defense of the ability to know the truth and how we know truth and how we provide rational arguments for truth, you could say it was at the very core of what, what he was doing in his fight against the Nazis. You know, he was fighting against the state-sponsored relativism of, of National Socialism. There's a, there's a terrible episode that he describes where um, he wasn't present for this, but his colleagues at the University of Munich after he had been fired from the university were brought into a session where the, the culture minister of the Bavarian culture minister spoke and he said, from this moment forward, in your various disciplines, you no longer have to ask whether something is true, only whether it corresponds to the spirit of Nazism. Oh, wow. So that's, that's what I mean by state-sponsored relativism, you know, a kind of uh, a, 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 a political regime that simply says the, only, the ultimate source of truth and the arbiter of truth is the regime itself, or in this case, the Fuhrer, right, Hitler. And, uh, and so, so to answer your question, a book defending the ability to know the truth and making it persuasive is, at the end of the day, at the very heart of what, he was, of what von Hildebrand was trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. I have um, probably a very uh, controversial question, but I want to ask it. How do you think Professor Hildebrand would view what is currently going on in our country today? Yeah. That's a, that, that's a... <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it in a couple of different ways. So um, let me answer it in a, in a way that is somehow provocative and might give you a sense of how he might, might answer it. So he says in one place that many people said to him that how can you really accuse the Nazis of all of these things? After all, they're not a, 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 they have no, they're not a group of philosophers. They don't have an intellectual platform. It's just a political movement, right? And Van Hildebrand said that, that um, that every political movement had, as he called it, he, he said it had an ethos, meaning that it expressed its core values through all of its expressions. So the spirit of its leaders, the style of its propaganda, the, the way it treats people who are weak, um, its stance towards the church, um, is there respect for religious freedom? In other words, he thought that even if you grant that the Nazis are sort of lack any coherent political philosophy, which he didn't think, by the way, um, you can still identify much about what they stand for through their actions, through the spirit, through the style of their, um, of their leaders and through everything that happened. I think that von Hildebrand would be deeply concerned by what he saw in our culture today. I think he would think that sort of regardless of left and right um, and uh, all of the different allegiances that we feel today that, um, that a, um, for example, the resurgence of racism today, sort of regardless of whether, we, um, whether it gets, it's hyped up, does it get abused by, for example, does the left abuse um, uh, uh, racism or make accusations that are sometimes exaggerated, perhaps, but he would say it doesn't matter when racism exists and when it's, when it's fomented. Um, I think he would be, deeply concerned with the lack of seriousness with the truth in our culture. Um, again, regardless of whether in any given instance, you know, um, 
one can say that a certain someone in our culture is telling the truth or not, he would say that there's a lot of, um, it's a lot of flippancy with the truth, a lot of unseriousness about the truth. Um, I think that this issue of, of the concern for the weak and the poor would, would, would disturb him a great. I think he, I think he would think that a, a political model that is driven by winning and defeating one's enemies was pretty profoundly concerning for a Christian. So this is, I, I partially I don't, I, I can't answer the question because he's not here, right? And I think it's, it's difficult to say, I know exactly what Dietrich von Hildebrand would say in our present moment, but I think we have a pretty good indication of the things that would concern him um, today. Uh, and again, my, my earlier point is important, you know, uh, the Nazis and the communists hated each other as left and right, and von Hildebrand sort of existed in a, in a in a, in, a, in a zone outside of that. He didn't want to be defined by questions of left and right. He thought the questions were basically questions of truth, right? And if, if, if truth is, um, is, is being abandoned by both the left and the right, it doesn't mean that there isn't a, a political position that you can take on the basis of truth. That's why Van Hildebrand had so many enemies wherever he went, because he managed to offend everyone. <laughs> Well, I'll answer that in a slightly humorous and, and sort of embarrassing way for myself. So I'm not related to him um, as a member of the family, but I've worked very closely with his widow, Alice von Hildebrand, for many years, who's still alive at the age of 94. And, and uh, she, uh, I, I'd almost like to say, you know, I was on the, the EWTN live show yesterday, and, you know, we're doing Q&A, and suddenly Alice von Hildebrand calls in. <laughs> but, I remember once she said to me, um, uh, you know, uh, you remind me in some ways of my husband. And I thought, oh, this is incredible. And I thought, what, a, what an incredible honor. And she said, yes, you're impulsive and unreliable the way he was. <laughs> <laughs> she is a, a scorekeeper. In the best sense of the term, and I have, I have grown, I think, uh, in, my, in my work with her. But in any case, it's, it's through my work with her, and so the Hildebrand Project is also the estate for the Hildebrands, and so all of the papers and manuscripts and also all the copyrights and the, and the responsibility for keeping the works in print and having them translated, all of that is ours. So that's why we have the, co the, the passports. But you'll be delighted to know that the, the way I found them was that you know, she, whenever I come, she says, you know, take all of this stuff away. You know, she needs to know it's sort of going, it's moving forward. And I was sort of going through a drawer once, and all of a sudden I, I find, I think it's a shoebox. And I open it up, and it's filled with these passports, among other things. I think also von Hildebrand's driver's license uh, from maybe 1914 or so, and then his military uh, uh, record. You know, since he didn't fight in the war, he had to still go for mandatory military. He, he, was, he worked for the Red Cross during World War I, so all the times he went to sign in, all of that was in this box, you know. And, and so that, that's usually, so every time I go to visit her, I expect discoveries uh, of precious things. By the way, she always says, of course, dear one, of course. I said, well, you might have known it was there, but I didn't know it was there. Yeah. <laughs> May God reward you, John, um, Henry, for coming in. I really appreciate it. I know it's been a real pleasure for all of us. I have a question about the memoir. So what I understand, he stopped short of writing them five, but it was an effort for Alice. And then he stopped for writing them five years before he got to the end date when he was going to finish writing them uh, for her. And then it was because of Abby, too. And I love how he said in the presentation that he had such a sense of like something was happening and we need to stand up and we need to say something. And so that came to mind when I remember like, oh, he stopped writing his memoirs. So just wondering, what was so important that was happening in the church at the time? Because the refugee in America, this is going on, he's writing his memoirs. What happened that he had to stop writing? And then second, um, does this still apply for us today in the effort of an evangelization? And so I'd just love to hear you talk about that. And then second, when you have first time, I would love to hear you talk about his relationship with Alice and how they met. I think there's at least three questions. <laughs> That, that was a great question. So just very briefly to uh, try to answer the easy part. So the memoirs were written for Alice because she said to him one day, um, by the way, she was 34 years younger than he. So um, let's just accept it. 
<laughs> and as a result, she always had a high level of sympathy when someone she knew would, would marry, and there was a great age difference. She said, well, she would say, well, I did it. So in any case, she, um, they were married in 1959, and uh, she said to him one day, you know, I've missed so much of your life. It, it grieves me. And he said, I'll write it for you. And as she says, as a good German, he produced 5,000 pages. Um, but as a, uh, well, actually, that's what I would say. As a good German, he produced 5,000 pages. As a, as a little French woman, she puts a sort of French twist on it, a Belgian woman. She says, it was the longest love letter ever written. So he wrote uh, from the beginning of his life, his youth in Florence, his conversion, the fight against the Nazis, and then it trails off, as you were saying, in the, in the late 1930s. It gets sort of thinner and thinner. And what came onto the scene was it was Vatican II, and it was his concerns over, the, um, over many issues in connection to the council, um, especially the, um, the loss of what he perceived as the, the sacredness and the sacrality of the Latin Mass. This grieved him deeply, and he wrote um, a great deal on it. And he was certainly a critic of m many aspects of the council in terms of the implementation. But I think it's so important to note that von Hildebrand, who at the time really was very much associated with being a critic of the council, was in many ways the father, or a father, of many things in the council. So on marriage, his work on marriage finds its ex expressions in, in what the council teaches on the idea of marriage as an act of union and procreation. Religious liberty has roots in his thought. The whole treatment of the Jews in light of his fight against anti-Semitism had an enormous influence on Christian philosophy. Um, it goes on and on. So it's an interesting case of someone who maybe didn't even recognize his own offspring um, because he was so concerned as a loyal son of the church with what he saw happening in the church. It's just very important to underscore that because he's often recruited as a kind of um, sort of a famous and prestigious critic of everything that the council represents, when in fact he, that, that would be a, a great overstatement. And then as far as how they met, it's, it's really quite a wonderful story. The first time she met him was at a, and he would give these kind of evenings of recollection. And in fact, the book Transformation in Christ, which I see over there, which is maybe his religious masterpiece, um, he would give an evening on each chapter of the book. And so Alice, as a young girl, uh, maybe, uh, how old would she have been? Maybe in her early 20s, 1942, uh, she met, uh, I think it was 1942 that she met him. Um, she goes, and his topic is chapter one of this book, The Readiness to Change, The Readiness to Change. And despite her, as she says, wonderful convent education in Belgium, deeply Catholic culture, um, uh, Catholic education. She'd never met someone, let alone a lay person, who had such a vibrant life of prayer and a, um, who, who's, whose joy in Christian living was as profound as what she encountered there. She had had, it had somehow been more rote. It was, it was like the difference between reading the catechism and meeting a living Christian. And this is saying a lot for someone who owes, who, who to this day speaks with gratitude of her Catholic education. But there was something new and something alive in him. And, and so that was the beginning of their meeting. And then she, she, she went on and became his student and took many of his classes at Fordham University. And then she's the reason so many of, these, of his books ever got published because he, he was too poor as a refugee from the war to hire a secretary to type his manuscripts. He would write everything out by hand and they would have just ended up in a drawer. And she was the person who typed these things. And she typed and typed and retyped because he would decide he wanted to add a chapter or a paragraph. And so a big book, was a book called Christian Ethics, about 500 pages long. She said she typed it five times because of his continuing inspiration. And then uh, his first wife died in 1957. And that had been a long marriage of over 40 years. And his first wife was a heroic woman completely shared his anti-Nazism, made all this, many of the same sacrifices, gave up the home and the security of the home. And, um, and so, but then there was a very special relationship between Dietrich and Alice. The, uh, it, was, it, it was just different. The, early, the first marriage had been a, the marriage of his youth, and they had a, they had a son together, um, and they, lived, you know, they, they both lived a deep Christian life. They converted together. Um, with Alice, there was this different element, which was this great sort of intellectual and spiritual 
um, harmony between the two of them. Um, his first wife had, had, had no, real in, no, no philosophical interest, so she, she was proud of him for his work, but she didn't have any interest in it. I don't think she ever read any of his books. But, here, but then, he meets, then he marries Alice, and the two of them form this kind of partnership. And so she's even the co-author of a number of his books, and then she, and then in his later years, she, she had the strength, you know, she's a little frail Belgian lady, even at the time when she was younger, she was frail. She says he, he never understood how exhausting it was uh, to be his wife because he thought, well, you're younger than me. But he had, this, he had this incredible vitality, and apparently one of his friends once said to her, you know, uh, he's going to bury you <laughs> because of his intensity. You know, he, he was always the last one standing when she needed, she was, it may not appear this way, but she was a, she, she's rather an introvert who needs to sort of recharge, and so there was a certain... Uh, and that, I don't know whether they could have married each other if they'd been the same age. I mean, that, maybe she wouldn't have lasted. <laughs> then again, she's 94 years old and going, going strong. So, sorry, long answer for some very good questions. Thank you for the presentation. Do you see a parallel between uh, von, Hildebrand, von Hildebrand's opposition to totalitarianism in the 30s and the current rise of a secular statism in Europe that threatens the Christian underpinning and the dignity of the person in Europe and in this country today? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, the, I keep doing this, I apologize. Um, I mean, von Hildebrand, uh, so on the one hand, he still lived in a time and place where, uh, you know, you had a, a church that, you know, had a kind of almost equal position in society to, to uh, to the government, um, and you know it was even possible in Austria that it, in the 1920s there had been a chancellor who who was a priest. You know something that we we can hardly imagine. So there was a much closer link between the church and the state, and the church influenced um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 life of the state and its policies much more. I think at the same time, though, it's interesting to ask the question sort of for today because that's that's not maybe a not, in the, not, not anytime soon is that even a viable idea, you know, that there would be a, um, a church that would have that kind of power in any case. And in fact, George Weigel says something very interesting about the modern papacy. He says that it was good for the papacy to lose its states and its political power because it allowed it to become a real moral voice and a moral authority. So, you know, if we, we take that as a sort of template, you could say that in some ways it's good perhaps that the church gives up some of its political power and prestige so the question then is, what is the role of the church in, um, in a world particularly where the state um, seeks to um, marginalize the church and banish the church? And certainly von Hildebrand would have been an outspoken de defender of the right and the duty of the church to shape the culture and to influence the culture and to, and, and to hold the government accountable. The idea that the, that the church sort of belongs exclusively in the realm of the private would have been something that he would have totally opposed. Or in today's battles over religious liberty, the idea that the church, that, that, that religious liberty really just means your right to worship in your own place of worship, as opposed to living your faith fully as a citizen of this country. He would have been one of our foremost defenders of religious liberty. Um, so uh, it's, it's hard to answer the question much beyond that. Uh, I don't know whether I've answered it maybe as you would like it to be answered, but I think he would have wanted to, I don't think he was in the business of trying to sort of propose a, a like a quasi-political role for the church. I think he probably also thought that Ultimately, the church was better um, when it was, when it was I don't want to say forced, but when it was obliged to carry out its witness purely through um, the, its leadership, the public statements of the bishops. By the way, that's why he was um, so upset by the Catholic bishops, particularly the Catholic bishops and, and the clergy in, in Nazi Germany, because he thought, that, he thought that they had an obligation to speak openly against the regime. And he thought, he says in one place, if only they had done that, he, he takes the view, a remarkable view, that, that it, it's quite possible that if the Catholic bishops had spoken at the right moment, that the Hitler movement may never have grown to the degree that it did. It's a debatable point, but his idea was simply that, that the, the church has to proclaim the gospel and its truths in season and out of season. And he held the, particularly the, the bishops to very, very high account. It's worth noting also that, of course, he did something very unusual at the time, which is that he was a layman, right? I mean, for a layman to speak as a Catholic in such a public way, 
was a remarkable and a unique thing. And so that's another thing that he, that he offers all of us today. It, it, we don't only, I mean, we, sh we, we should, with all due respect, of course, look to our, our, our priests and our bishops for leadership, but we're also, as lay people, particularly those of us who are formed in the faith and um, who are given positions of leadership and authority, we're also able to bear witness. We can't just delegate that to our clergy. So it's, it's a, as so often the case, it's a both hand, right? I mean, um, Van Hildebrand would have been, it was always calling on, on the clergy to speak more forcefully in difficult moments, but he was modeling for us uh, the contribution of the laity. John Henry, to conclude, would you please just briefly recap the takeaways from the end of the talk? Um, sure. That might be good to, to yeah, well, so, and of course there are more than these, and I just wanted to highlight um, some that I thought were sort of unique to Van Hildebrand himself. So the first was this idea of, well, look, looking to Hildebrand and admiring the incredible independence that he showed. I, there, there's a, I was once um, talking with a historian of the um, 1920s and 30s, um, and particularly of the Catholic Church's actions during that time, and he said to me, it's just astounding how totally uninfluenced he was by ideas that were in the air. You know, the, for example, on the nationalism, which was you know what what stirred up so much of the fervor that then translated into the wars, right? This sense that, uh, and for so many people, fighting in World War One was it was a tremendous honor as a German. But von Hildebrand said, no, this isn't this isn't. There's something wrong, and he made the distinction between nationalism and patriotism. He said that nationalism is the love of one's country in such a way that one stands in a hostile relationship to other countries. Patriotism, he said was the love of one's own country in such a way that one could honor the contributions and distinctive sort of the special genius of other countries as well. So a nationalist German would hate France and, and, and England and anyone who was not an ally. A patriotic German would love his homeland perhaps above all else, but he would have deep gratitude for the great contributions of France and England and Germany. And that was von Hildebrand. He embodied this tremendous uh, love of all of Europe. He was a real uh, European in that sense. Now, the, but that's, that's all by the by. So the, the, uh, the point I wanted to make was that, that the, the fact that he was so uninfluenced by this nationalism that was in the air, or the anti-Semitism, which, which crept into so many different crevices. Even in his family, there were bits of it among some of his sisters, and, or maybe not his sisters, but um, some, some of the relatives in the family. And there were people who helped him in his fight against Nazism, but then would make these, these they, they, would, they cast out these little asides about these, these disgusting Jews, and why do, you, why do you stand, why do we want them in the church anyway? But we hate Hitler, right? You know, we want to oppose Hitler. So the, the, the takeaway is simply that we have to both admire this independence of mind, but then we also have to cultivate it in ourselves. What are the influences in the culture today that we have unconsciously taken in? In what respect do I not, uh, live primarily as a Christian, so to speak, um, and a lover of truth, and in what, what, what set, in what sense am I kind of a typical American and hold typical attitudes, uh, many of which we have to hold up against higher standards. So that's, that's the, the first takeaway, maybe a little bit um, more extensive than you were asking. Um, then there's this idea of the, the universal calling and the individual, or the universal norms and the individual calling. By that I mean that we all understand ourselves to be obliged to follow, for example, the Ten Commandments. There's nothing optional. It's not like, well, I, I opt in and you can opt out. Um, we're all bound by that together. And Van Hildebrand would never have questioned that, but he would also have said that in, in the context of these universal norms, there are individual callings that God places on an individual life. So he thought that he was called uh, to this particular sacrifice to risk his life and to give up his homeland and to do what he went on to do. Um, and, and so I think what he would say to us today is that we have to ask ourselves what, I mean, on the assumption that we're all trying to live a good Christian life and we're trying to live by these universal norms, uh, what, what is God's unique calling on my life? Now obviously, you know, it's not that no one here has done that um, in the in the realm of your personal vocations, for example, and in your families, but he would say perhaps in the realm of um, our, our witness as Catholics in our society, in the larger culture, perhaps some of us shy away from things that we are actually called to do, things that might make us uncomfortable, but that when we discern, 
when we pray about, we, we realize that we are in fact called to that. And, and so that would be the idea of a kind of further personal calling. And I wonder what else I want to highlight for you today. I mean, the then, then I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of other things I could say, but to just restate the final um, point that I had made, there's this idea that vital ideas have to be championed. Sometimes we think that um, the truth, uh, if it's true, I mean, what, what what can I add to the fact that it's true? Well, we can champion it. We can bear witness to it. Sometimes the most compelling argument for the truth of something isn't really the argumentation. It's the, it's the way in which someone lives it. I think that's one of the, the ways in which von Hildebrand's witness is so powerful. It's not just that he leaves this record of articles behind, which would be incredibly impressive, right? I mean, to, uh, to read these is, to be, is, a, is a kind of education almost. But it's, it's the life of the man. It's to hear in his own voice the spiritual journey that he took. Uh, that, to me, is in a way the most compelling aspect of the witness. Now, you can't separate it from his thoughts in his, in his words, but um, as I said at the beginning, you know, he could have been a sort of a, a grouchy, professorial Catholic who, who was angry that he had lost his post and was writing these pieces as a sort of outlet, or, you know, he, he lived gracefully and graciously and with gratitude for his life on every day. So with, with that in mind, I just want to maybe as a concluding comment tell you what he once said to his wife, Alice, at the end of his life. Um, she said to him, wasn't it difficult for you who had been raised in beautiful homes and in such beautiful places and surrounded by friends and, and, and a wonderful teaching career um, to have to give that all up, live in poverty, live in slummy apartments, live constantly, uh, when, when his escape began, he had to live really totally by charity, had no resources whatsoever. Um, generally, he didn't have the money to buy himself the, the, or to provide for the meal for his family for that day. And she says that he looked at her with total astonishment. And he said, how can you ask me that? Not for anything would I have given up the chance for tasting the sweetness of Christian charity. So, so that's my final statement. Thank you.